read this and it and, and wanted to know more. How do you put on this armor of God? How do you wear it? It's obviously not physical armor. You know, we might look silly if we all walk around with helmets and shields, you know. <laughs> then again, it might you might look safe. But how do you put on this, this this spiritual uniform, this spiritual armor that Ephesians is talking about? And this is not the only place that the Bible speaks of wearing the spiritual armor. And so we'll go and look at all the scriptures that uh, speak to this. But I want to go through each one in detail. And I don't really feel led to go over them in the order in which they're written here. Because even as the Spirit of God was moving on the Apostle Paul in speaking of the armor of God... You'll notice in verse 16, he says, above all, above all. It'd be, like, it'd be like giving somebody a list of seven things to do and then emphasizing three of them. And if you're a parent with kids, you have to do that. You have to give them a list of seven things and emphasize two or three in this. You know, if I get that done, I'll be satisfied. All right. And so God, in his word, gives us this full armor and he tells us to put the whole armor on. But right in the middle of that context, he says, now, above all. Make sure you take the, the, the shield of faith and the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. And, and what I actually want to do is begin with the helmet of salvation. What is the helmet of salvation? What does this represent in scripture? So that'll be one of the first uh, pieces to this armor that we're going to talk about. But if you would put a bookmark here in the, uh, the book of Ephesians 6, because we'll be looking at this uh, for, for weeks ahead. And even, even in this service, we're going to turn back to it. So just have that handy. Your Bible, some Bibles come with a shoestring. You just put that right there, and there it is handy. So let's back up to verse 10 we read before the prayer. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Might is one of the seven anointings of the Holy Spirit listed in Isaiah chapter 11, verse, verse number 2. The Holy Spirit offers seven different <coughs> anointings are endowments or blessings and might is one of them. He says, put on the whole armor of God. Now the rest of this verse gives purpose to the armor of God. And you've heard me say many times that anytime you do not understand something's purpose, abuse is inevitable. Help me with that one time. Anytime you don't understand something's purpose, abuse is inevitable. So no matter what a thing is, when you don't know its purpose, you tend to abuse it. I, as a kid, would grab a claw hammer out of my daddy's toolbox to dig a trench in the dirt. And then he'd have to come and remove the claw hammer from my hand and tell me that's not what claw hammers are for, and then give me a shovel in, in its place. My dad has caught me using a crescent wrench trying to drive a nail in a wall and come take the crescent wrench out of my hand and say, son, you need the hammer. And so as a little boy, I would just take whatever I thought would do the job. Come on, somebody. If you've ever been guilty of using something that wasn't meant for that thing. Some of y'all clapping about it. All right. Then. So when you don't understand something's purpose, abuse is inevitable. And here in verse 11, we find the purpose on why we need the whole armor of God. So he says, put on the whole armor of God. Read that out loud. Put on the whole armor of God. I want you to read that again, except I want you to emphasize the words put on. Ready? Read. Put, put on, on the whole armor of God. So this is saying that it's my responsibility. This is my burden. This is this is this is a, 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 a call that I've been given, that I have to be responsible enough to know what to put on. And he says, put on the whole armor of God. And then the, the rest of that verse gives us purpose. And the purpose is that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. What are the wiles of the devil? The wiles of the devil, the word wiles just means strategies. I, 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 I think we underestimate our enemy sometimes that the enemy is strategic. The enemy is very strategic and you most see his strategy when you make a decision to walk in line with the will of God. If you think for a minute right now that you're too removed from faith or you're too removed from prayer or the word of God or Jesus to be dealing with spiritual warfare. If you think that's something for other people, that's not really me. 
I'm not that spiritual. I'm just visiting here tonight because I was driving down Bird Coons and saw the parking lot lights on, all right? Wherever you may be in life, all of us face the strategy of the enemy, whether we know it or not. And I can prove to you that the enemy is real in his strategies against us by just giving you some simple assignments. So I'm going to give you three assignments to do at any given time after you leave here. And you come back and testify next Wednesday whether or not the enemy actually is strategic in his warfare. Before I give them to you, let me say this. To every one of us, to every person that ever lived, there is a plan that God has for our life. We were created for a purpose. And that ultimate purpose that every one of us have, no matter where you are in life right now, whether you are a, 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 a preacher or whether you are a, a, a bricklayer or whether you are an entrepreneur or school teacher, doesn't matter. Wherever you are right now, our purpose is to bring God glory. That was the reason that man was created to bring God glory. That's our purpose. That was the purpose that God gave man upon creation. It's recorded in Psalms 8 verses 1 through 4. That's God's purpose. That my life bring him glory. That's what Jesus was speaking of in Matthew chapter 5. When in verses 13 and 16 he talks about us living a life that would bring God glory. Because ultimately that's the end purpose of my life. No matter what my occupation or vocation is. The purpose of my life is to bring him glory. Whatever position God has for you and me, the enemy will always oppose. That's called opposition. Oppo opposition is opposed position. So if you look at what you know God has planned for you, that position, that purpose that you know God has for you as a mama, as a daddy, as a husband, as a wife, as a parent, as a teacher, as a minister, whatever that purpose is, that place that when you're there and you're operating in your gift and in your call and you're fulfilling your purpose, that place will always be opposed by the enemy. Now, let me just get as basic as I can in this. The original place that God had man when he created man in the garden at the very beginning, the original place that he had for man was in his presence. He walked with God daily. But when man sinned against God, he got out of the presence of God. How many of us can testify that we have sinned and let our sin take us out of the presence of God? My hand is in the air. I've been there, all right? Even, even now, that is the enemy's objective to get me out of the presence of God. God's heart for man, God's heart for man was revealed when man sinned. Because in sin, man was hid from God. If you read the Genesis account in chapter 3, God's first recorded words after man sinned, his first recorded words, God's first recorded words are in Genesis 3, 7 when he says, Adam, where art thou? Not Adam, what have you done? Not Adam, how dare you? Not Adam, I'm going to get you for that. Ain't no place you can run and hide because I know where you're at. No, that was not the first recorded words of God. The first recorded words of God were, Adam, where art thou? Because he missed Adam's presence. He missed the relationship that he desired to have with man. And if there's anything that frustrates me about bad religion, is that bad religion tells people that if you do the list of certain things, you can work your way to God. Man cannot work his way to God. Sin has separated us from God. That's why Jesus came. Jesus came to pay the price that I owe. He came to spill his blood so that I could have forgiveness, so that I could be forgiven, so that I could be redeemed, so that I could get back what I lost when I sinned. And when man sinned, he didn't lose religion. He didn't lose his name on a church roll. When man sinned against God, he lost relationship with God. Jesus came into this world to bring back what man had lost. What man had lost was not religion. What man had lost was a relationship with God. And so Jesus came to restore the relationship that, that, that God desired to have with man. Jesus paid our price. And the cross reconciles man back to God. A relationship. So, I told you I'd give you three things. 
When it comes to anything that advances your relationship with God, I can guarantee you, you're going to find opposition. So if I could just think off the top of my head, three things that enhances my relationship with God. I could get more. I'm just going to get three. I could say, okay, prayer. When I'm praying, I'm talking to God. If I'm praying right, I, 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 I might even hear from God. Number two, when I'm in his word. Whether that's at home at my kitchen table, reading the word of God, or in an assembly like this where the word of God is open, then, then I'm getting into his presence. All right? When we gather corporately for, for praise and prayer and worship and the ministry of the word, Hebrews 10.38 says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Don't forsake assembling yourselves together as the manner of some is. So let's just use those three. Prayer, getting in the word, and getting in assembly. Try those three and see how much opposition you get. If you go home tonight and decide you're going to get into prayer, everything that can happen will happen to distract you from prayer. If you make a decision to get in the word, everything that can happen will seem to happen to prevent you from getting in the word. When you make a decision to go to church, you and your spouse can be getting along just perfect and everything is rosy until you're on your way to church. Then you're mad about where's my shoes. Then she's mad about that you're trying to blame her and you're not blaming her, you're just frustrated over the shoes. And then you get in the car and you're agitated that why didn't you put some gas in the car? Why didn't I put some gas in the car? I'm the one that, that carpools all the kids around. Why didn't you put gas in the car? Well, well it ain't my car. I, I pay the car note. You are built by the gas. Well, you know what? Forget going to church because I really don't like your attitude. See, that kind of stuff happens on your way to church because anytime you're trying to get in the position that, that you know is in line with the will of God, there's going to always be opposed position. And I just gave you three things, and I guarantee you, if I went around the room, everybody kept their head and say, yes, I've seen some opposition when I try to do any of those three things, getting in prayer, getting in the Word, or simply going to church. How many of you have met opposition doing those three things? Raise your hand and see everybody. Look around. Everybody hand up. Amen. All right? That's true. Now, we're not even talking about you actually yielding your life to the Spirit of God and being used to lead others to Jesus, being used to, to, to bless somebody, to help somebody, to mentor somebody, to speak life into someone. We're not even talking about the, the, the actions of your life. I'm just talking about relational with God, how much opposition you face. You, 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 you can't just expect that you're going to walk in this place that God has called you to walk out Without there being some opposition or opposed position. Wherever God wants you, the enemy does not. Are you hearing me? Listen, let me, let me, let me, let me say this. Uh, Brother Jefferson, would you step up here just for a minute? Uh, I'm, I'm going to give this an example. Because we have to be able to see through what the enemy is after. One of the first times that this brother uh, attended this, this, this ministry, you don't mind me telling this, he got offended. And when he left that day, he left offended with his family. And you, you pretty much said, I'm never going back to church, right? How long was it before the Holy Spirit addressed you and said, man, you can't let that offense sit in? How long was it before you, you left, before that happened? The same night, the Holy Spirit addressed with you and said, hey, you can't get offended. And you came back and you're heavily involved. One of our, our, our key volunteers, your wife is on staff here, your children are at the school. Think of how different your life would have been had the enemy been able to keep you offended that night you left this church offended. Had, had you not listened to the Holy Spirit, your life might look totally different right now. See, the offense that the enemy tried to plant in your heart was evidence that this is where God wanted you. And so the enemy was trying to form a wedge to keep you away. We have to be willing to see. Wait a minute, enemy. What are you trying to do? Why are you working so hard to keep me out of this place? It must be something about this place. Man, I'm so glad you're here, brother. Love you, man. Bless you. Thank you. Let me give you a testimony. Glory to God. Brother Jeff, is everything I say correct? All right. I want to make sure. That's why I brought you up here. All right. We have to be able to see that we're dealing with warfare in the enemy when it comes to the place that God wants us in. Now, watch, watch this word here. We're getting a lot out of just verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, 
the strategies, the schemes of the devil. Whatever it is that he's up to, I don't want it to work in my life. Does anybody bear witness with that? Whatever the enemy is up to, I don't want it to work in my life. If he is strategizing about my life, about my marriage, about my children, about my future, about this ministry, if he's, if he's got a strategy, I don't want that strategy to work. And i got a promise in the word of God that it won't if I'll stand on that promise. And that's Isaiah 54, 17, when it says, No weapon formed against thee shall prosper. If you know that verse, say it out loud. No weapon formed against, against thee, thee shall, shall prosper. prosper. Now, in the light of what we just read, what is the key word in Isaiah 54, 17? No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. Do you know the key word in that verse based on what we're reading? What will be the key word? Formed. No weapon formed against thee shall prosper. What does that mean? That means the enemy forms weapons. He forms things. He works on things. He's a planner. He is strategic to keep us out of the place that God has called us to be. But he says here, if I have on the whole arm of God, I'm able to stand. I'm able to stand. He's not going to move me. I'm able to stand in that place, in that position, in that role, in that purpose that God has called me to. Now he goes on to say here in verse 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You got to be able to see through the conflict that we have with folk. Mm -hmm. And realize that if the folk we're dealing with are not sensitive to the Holy Spirit, then what I'm actually dealing with is spiritual, not fleshy. And so if I let this person get me in the flesh, I've stepped out of my victory. You know how we say they almost got me in the flesh? There's something to that. Because when you get in the flesh, you step out of a walk in harmony with the Holy Spirit. Now... If you would, keep that bookmark right here in Ephesians. And I want you to turn back to the book of Romans. And I want to go to the 13th chapter, Romans chapter number 13. Now, some of you today, because as I minister this message, for those watching by uh, YouTube or by our telecast, uh, it might be morning, it might be night. I don't know what time of day it is that you're, that you're hearing this. But as I minister this message... Uh, it is the end of the day, and and some of you, or some of you, for some of you, it's the end of the day, and you may have come in straight from work, or you might have went home and had your chance to get you a little bite to eat, and maybe even change clothes. You might even shower it up and change before you got here. We appreciate that. <laughs> if you didn't have a chance to shower, we just appreciate that you brush your teeth. Right. So when you when you put on something new. Or when you put on something clean, you got to put off what's dirty. You don't put on something new on top of what's old. So before you put anything on, you got to put something off. And so I think we need to spend a little bit of time talking about what we need to put off. Because before we can put the right things on, we need to put the right things off. Mm -hmm. So let's look at it in Romans 13. Verse number 12, Romans 13, if you're there, say, say amen. amen. Watch it with me in verse number 12. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. When you're in the dark and when you're asleep, you don't know what's going on around you. Hmm? When you're in the dark and you're in the sleep and, and you're asleep, you're not in touch with your surrounding. And there, it, 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 there are many that are awake, but spiritually they're asleep because they're not aware of what's going on. There's no sensitivity to what's actually happening in their lives. God is saying here, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off, cast off. Here's some things you need to put off. The works of darkness. And let us do what? Put on the armor of light. So there's that word armor again. And it's talking about putting on 
armor, but he's saying before you put on the armor that is of God, before you put on the armor that is of light, you need to take off the works of darkness. There's some things you need to remove if you're going to put on the right thing. So watch what he goes on to say here. Verse 13. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and in drunkenness, not in chambering or in wantonness, not in strife, not in envy, but put on, put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Come with me to Colossians chapter number three. Colossians chapter number three. So Romans 13 is saying, hey, there's some things you need to put off before you talk about what you're you going to put on. And I really wanted to just talk about what to put on and get into this armor. And I just felt this conviction and, and it wouldn't go away that I needed to talk a minute about what we need to put off. Because, listen, there's no sense in putting something on for Sunday when that's not what you put on Monday. Because if you don't, if you don't, if you don't put off what God's called you to put off, and you just wear something for a couple of hours a week, then you're really just a put on. And we don't want to be a put on. We want to put on. Y'all with me? I watch this in Colossians chapter 3. And we'll look at it in, uh, in verse number 8. Colossians 3, verse number 8. But now you also put off all of these. Put off all these. Read it out loud. Put off all of these. God is saying in his word, before you talk about what you, you need to put on, here's what I want you to put off. Now you're going to have to be the one, I'm going to have to be the one to look at this and say, okay, I've been putting that on. I need to take that off. I don't need to be wearing that. And here's what he says here. Put off, put off all these. Anger. Anger. Man, everybody. Short fuse. Blowing up at folk. Man. Mad at folk that didn't have nothing to do with the reason why you're mad. That'll make me mad sometimes. I'm like, wait a minute, I can't get mad at your madness when you're mad at me, and I'm not the reason you're mad at me. I didn't ask you to get this job. I would not ask you for the ketchup. Had you put the ketchup out here where I could have got it. Huh. Isn't it rough when you ask somebody for something that only they can give you and they get mad that you ask? Or you go through the drive through and you order something, they don't give you what you ordered, so you just tell them, hey, I didn't get this, they get mad. Look, I ain't my fault. You put it, if you put it in the bag, I wouldn't ask. <laughs> Damn, I'm <my> proud. <laughs> yeah. You can't get too mad because they got your food. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank God for those people that work in fast food lines because you know everybody is wanting to eat. They ain't cooking the house and they got to put up with all these attitudes and people coming through the line and hollering about this and that and the other. And then sometimes, I guess, if you're in that window, you can't help but take it out on the next person. You have nothing to do with it. We don't know what came before you. But we can get critical and we can get aggravated when they say, could you pull forward? Because nobody wants to pull forward. I, went to the, I, I, I drove through the drive through because I didn't want to park. You're going to put me out there and make me wait. You're going to forget out there and I'm going to be stuck out there and I'm going to come in anyway and I'm going to be mad and messing my money. Well, we really don't need to be so critical. We need to thank God for the people that could, that could build a, 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 a sausage biscuit with egg and cheese that fast. That's miraculous. God Amen. <laughs> now watch this. He says, put off Put off. There are things that we need to put off. Verse 8. He says, put off all of these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication. Amen. Using not only curse words, but curse words when you speak, you know, ill over somebody. But a, a, a foul word that's still... Filthy communication. That, that stuff shouldn't be coming out of believers' mouths. Amen. He said, you need to put all that off. See, notice how important it would be that you put off filthy communication before you try to put on the sword of the Spirit. 
or before you try to put on the breastplate of righteousness. Can you imagine that you're wearing your breastplate of righteousness? You got your Jesus shirt on. <laughs> but curse words are coming out of your mouth. You should have put that off before you put your shirt on. <laughs> Am I right about it? Yeah. Hey, nothing worse than a cussing Christian with Jesus on their t-shirt. <laughs> flying by me because they think I'm driving too slow honking their horn, shooting me the bird out the window and, I, and you get in front of me and I look on the back of your car and I got a I love Jesus bumper sticker and you must be driving grandma's car you can't love Jesus talking to me like that <laughs> see how unfitting is it to put on things that embody Christ while other things that don't represent him are still in my life you know, I, I, I ministered this uh, today at our Middle High Chapel. And so I asked our students uh, in chapel today. By the way, th this morning, our students in our Middle High School, they led worship during chapel. And I don't know if I've ever seen anything like that. They, 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 the presence of God was just ushered in by these teenagers that were on instruments and singing. And it was just absolutely glorious. I was over there just bawling like, oh, Jesus, look what you're doing. It was just phenomenal. And so I'm so grateful for what God is doing at the academy. Yeah. But I, I'm ministering to the, the teenagers, uh, young men and women at the uh, at the Middle High Chapel today. And I'm talking about this. And so I asked them, we were talking about the helmet of salvation. We, we began to talk about it. So I asked them, I said, when you think about putting on a helmet, what comes to mind? And the first two things I got were the first two things I was looking for. Number one, I put on the helmet of salvation because I need protection. And we'll get into this more, Lord willing, next week when we start talking about the helmet of salvation. But we, you know we need to put on the helmet of salvation because there's some mess out here in this world that we don't need our mind infected with. So the helmet of salvation is for protection, mental, physical, spiritual uh, protection. But then when, when, I, when I went around the room and, and asked for another, the next thing I got was it represents what, which team you're on. And when you put that helmet on, you got that, that logo right there. And now I know what which team you play for. I know which team you're on by that helmet. You, we can't put on the helmet that says I'm a child of the king. And anger and, 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 and filthy words and, and malice and hate is coming out of our mouth. You, you don't represent the team whose, whose logo that you wear. We all don't know what we're doing. So notice he, he's saying there are things that we have to put off. And I'm just praying, you know, that, that the Lord would speak to us and say, okay, what in my life do I need to put off so that I can put on what's new? You know, uh, let's keep reading here. I, I, I want to get a lot, a lot more out before we, we close here in the next few minutes. He says in verse 9, lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off. The old man with his deeds. God, you, you put that man off. Don't, don't be lying like you did before you got saved. Don't be lying like you did before you knew Jesus. That man's supposed to be put off. That, that, that was what your baptism represented in Romans chapter 6 verse 4 when the Bible says that we are buried in the likeness of his death and raised to walk in newness of life. Baptism represents I'm, I'm not that man anymore. I'm not that person anymore. I'm ready to put that person off and to put on my, this new person. Does it mean I'm perfect? No, there's only one perfect. Does it mean I got it all together? No, it just means I want to get it all together. It, it, it represents a decision that I have made to live out my, my purpose and to let my life bring God glory and to see his will fulfilled in me. But notice he's saying here, put off what's old no, don't, don't, don't be lying like a rug. <laughs> then you get through lying to folks, you say, you want to go to church with me on Sunday? <laughs> I'll pick you up. You probably lied about that too. I get dressed and be <laughs> waiting and you didn't show up. <laughs> lying not went to another see that you have put off the old man with his deeds. Now watch this. Seeing that you've put that off, verse 10 says, and have what? Put on the new man. So notice we're seeing here in verses 8, 9, and 10, there are things we need to put off in order that we can put this new thing on. It's a process. So let, let, me, let me make this practical. 
because I don't have a few minutes left before we, before we wrap this up. Let me make this practical. Imagine you're uh, coming before the Lord in prayer and you really want his will. And so you go to you go to God in prayer and you say, Father, I come to you in Jesus' name and I don't know which way to go here. And, and, and I just need you to lead me. I need you to guide me. I'm asking that your will be done. All right. You're asking for the Lord so will be done in you. There's something there you're wanting to put on. I'm going to put on your will. I'm going to put on your spirit. I'm going to walk in your will. Imagine what would happen if we began the prayer with, Lord, I acknowledge all the times I've ignored you, disobeyed you, or have not sought you. And what that has brought to my life. And so I ask forgiveness. I ask that you would forgive me and cleanse me of the things I know that I've done that were outside of your will. See, then now I'm coming to God saying, Lord, I'm willing to put that off so I can put you on. It's not, Lord, I want your will on top of mine and I see how well it fits. But no, Lord, I'm removing me so I can have you. It's not, Lord, give me a good idea or bless my good idea. And so many times we do that. We go to God with what we think will work and we ask him to bless it. But it'd be so much better if we just made ourselves empty and then went to God and said, Lord, I don't have the answer, but I know you do. So just remove my thoughts about this and give me your will. For me, that's a personal conviction I have when I study the word. So many times when I'm studying the word, I'll ask the father in prayer. I'll say, Lord, just leave me. Father, I, I pretend to know nothing. I pretend to know nothing. In other words, I don't want to bring what I think I know into study. I don't want to bring what I think I know into a service. I don't want to set up under the ministry of his word and I'm bringing in what I think I know. And folks are bad about that in church. They're the people that finished the verse when I started. I let everybody around me know. I already know what the preacher's going to say. I missed Mr. Mr. Eels. Everybody around me don't need to know that. Nobody here does that. I'm just saying that. The point is, when we bring to God all the stuff we put on, and then we ask him to give us something, it does not fit. It does not work. Then there's a process of, Lord, I'm going to put this off so that I can put the right thing on. I'm putting this off so I can put your will on. That's what these scriptures are saying here. There are things that we need to put off in order to put on what he's called us to put on. Is that making sense? So how does that look in your life right now? What, what could you be putting off and then come before the Lord and ask him for something new in relationship to that old thing you just put off? Is there something in your life that's resonating right now? That, you know what? I've been doing it this way and doing it this way and doing it this way. And it's not working. I'm going to put that off so, Lord, I can put on your will. So I'm willing to remove that, Lord, so that, so that your will would be done in me. And, and being able to acknowledge the things that we put on that are not in line with the will of God, that have not worked, that have not brought him glory, and say, you know what, i got to put that off. And you, you look at these verses here, and, and it's, it's, it's real simple. I mean, anger. I mean, when we get mad and operate in the flesh, God's saying, put that off. Don't, don't expect to put on the fruit of the Spirit, which we're going to deal with in the series. And you want to put on love, but you had to put off hate. You want to put on meekness, but you hadn't put off pride. You want to put on truth, but you hadn't put on lying. All right. Now let's go back to Ephesians 6. And we'll, we'll, we'll be done here in a minute. So, put on. Put on the whole armor of God. That you may be able to stand against the wild strategies of the devil. Now, I want to give you some hope in closing, all right? Because wherever you are in life right now, whatever it is that you're facing in your life, and I'm not just saying this to be the, uh, you know, the guy that's giving you, you know, the good news and like, oh, he's just saying that to make me feel better. No, the gospel is called the gospel for a reason. And it's good news. And Jesus was anointed to preach the gospel. And we've been called to preach the gospel. That's what the Bible commissioned us to go preach was the gospel. Isn't it good that God didn't say, go into all the world and preach bad news? That's why I don't bring up the news in the pulpit. You don't need to hear about the news. The news is bad. 
You need to hear the good news. And the news is not talking about this news. We come here to hear this news, not, not, not other news. Right? So this is the good news. The word of God is the good news. It's called the gospel. And the good news is no matter what it is that you're facing right now, God has destined every one of us for victory. He, he, he never planned for the enemy to succeed in whatever strategy he has against your life. He, he has destined you to put on this armor and to walk in victory and for your life to bring him glory. That's his plan. And I want to give you some uh, some scriptures that, 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 that just back that up. Here's a few. First of all, 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5 says this. For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcomes the world? He that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. God's word is saying if you're a believer, if you're a believer in Jesus as the Son of God, you will overcome this world. You have been purposed. You have been destined to be victorious and to overcome. So no matter what it is that's facing you right now, you may have not been able to overcome it yet because you haven't put on the right armor to overcome. Maybe there's some things you need to put off and things you need to put on so that you can walk in the victory that God has ordained you to walk in. Let me give you another promise. First John chapter 2, verses 13 through 14. It says, I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because you have known the father. I have written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong. And the word of God abideth in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. He addresses every person in every walk of life and makes this final statement, you have overcome the wicked one. That's the plan of God. The plan of God is not that the enemy be your undoing, but rather that the enemy be your footstool and just elevate God and his promise in your life. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 12, verse 20. I give you another promise. He says, a bruised reed shall he not break and a smoking flax shall he not quench. Till he send forth judgment unto victory. What does that verse mean? A bruised reed will he not break or a smoking flax will he not quench? Well, there was a custom that when gathering wood to build a structure, if you came across a beam or wood that had a bruise that was, that was damaged, you would burn it or you would cut it up in pieces so that no one else would accidentally grab it and use it for building something. In other words, you discard any piece of wood that's been damaged. God's word is saying, speaking to us, I don't break and throw away bruised reeds. You might have some damage in your life. You might have gone through some things in your life. It may not even look pleasant in your life. You may look back at some things in your life and say, I know I can't be used. I've been bruised. I know I can't be used. Look at what I've done. He's saying in his word, no, I don't cast away the bruised reed. I bring forth victory. God is saying that no matter what your past looks like, my plan for your future is victory. Then he uses the second uh, uh, example. He says the smoking flax will he not quench. That's the wick in a candle that's so burnt it lets off black smoke. And so you would trim it so that it wouldn't let off that smoke anymore. God said, I don't cut you off. I still use you no matter what your past looks like. No matter what other people may think of you right now. I want to bring forth my victory in your life.